Well, I'm just going to try to engage in what we do, which is metaphysical reconstruction. And it's a very good uh, consulting business and not enough people in it. And uh, what I really want to talk about um, is the failure of traditional economics and uh, the GDP model. And gratefully, we're going to the SDGs now, but we're still stuck in most business schools um, with the GDP model and the price system. And uh, this, you, you cannot possibly uh, move forward by trying to use this kind of single metric because prices really are a measure of human ignorance. They're always uh, looking, they're always historic. And today we don't know the price of anything, um, you know, with all the cryptocurrencies and everything else. And of course, that the convention in accounting is still to allow for externalities, um, which makes really um, the whole system fraudulent. So I just want to, um, uh, to just uh, go into this a little more deeply. And uh, many years ago, when I wrote this book, uh, The Politics of the Solar Age in 1981, uh, which of course nobody understood then, <laughs> you know, being discussed now as the Green New Deal. <laughs> but back then, nobody understood what I was talking about. Uh, what I was really saying is that the total productive system of industrial societies, um, the top two layers of that cake are the only ones that are quantified in the price system and GDP monetized and everything like that. And the top, the lower two layers, which really support the entire thing, um, are still not in enough economic textbooks and not in enough business schools and financial classes. And what I call the love economy in every society, the traditional economy of the golden rule, do as you would be done by, you know, mutual interdependence. Those love economies in every society in the world are still much larger than the GDP money measured market sectors, which they still enfold and support, uh, but they're being stressed all the time because they're based on voluntary mutual cooperation. And of course, uh, mother nature was completely ignored for many years, that was part of the externalities. So the model that I continue to use, and now that uh, this model, I get questions every, almost every day for groups wanting to use it as a basis of uh, going beyond the GDP model to basically, this is the SDG model, the whole cake is the SGG model. So what we have done at um, Ethical Markets, which I founded in 2004, you know, we don't take advertising. I fund it basically, you know, with our television program royalties and whatnot. And um, we, um, in, we, with our partner, GlobeScan, um, we presented uh, the survey, the first survey we did in 12 countries of ordinary citizens, asking them uh, whether you should use GDP, money-based GDP as the best measure of global, of, of your country's development, or should you also include science-based metrics on um, health, uh, social and environmental statistics. And we did it, I presented the first one at the European Parliament in 2007, where they had the, the Beyond GDP conference. And it was absolutely uh, filled to the gills. Uh, all countries were represented in the European countries. And you can go to, um, uh, you can go to beyond-gdp.eu and they still put out reports all the time on this. Uh, we repeated that, that, the first one was 2007 where we found these huge majorities and uh, we repeated it in 2009 because we wondered whether people had been, because of the financial crisis, whether they had been regressed back into fear, you know. But no, that, that's held up. Then we did it in 2013. This is the one we did this year. And you can see those statistics are pretty much holding up. The next one is coming out next May. 
So we keep on banging on about education as the basic investment that every society has to make in producing um, healthy, literate citizens. And yet uh, too long uh, in GDP, um, uh, education is still categorized as consumption rather than as an investment. And the problem with GDP is it still doesn't have an asset account. So you have all of these investments needed, backed up, needed in public in infrastructure, public goods, green, you know, the whole shift to um, the Green New Deal, and of course, education. And if you had that asset account where all of these uh, public investments were properly valued and put on the other side of the balance sheet, uh, all countries' debt to GDP ratios could be cut by up to 50%, just with a couple of keystrokes. So it really is silly to go on doing this. And of course, we all know that money isn't scarce. It's not wealth. Money is simply a social protocol um, that we all happen to believe in. And the currencies fluctuate all over the world based simply on how many people trust them and use them. And of course, we remember over the history um, of, uh, of uh, um, societies, um, every time societies have gotten into a real jam with unrepayable debts, they've had a jubilee where debts are simply wiped out. And the last time this happened, if you all remember, was in the year 2000 um, with the uh, Jubilee 2000 uh, campaign by NGOs to uh, wipe off or wipe away most of the debts of the highly um, indebted uh, HIPAA countries. So we know how to do this. And um, so basically, um, I was very interested um, in uh, uh, looking at what happened at COP26, where you had the financial community finally realizing they were gonna have to jump into this game. So Mark Carney came there and announced this uh, group of financiers and their 130 trillion um, that they were gonna to commit to uh, climate change and net zero and all of this, um, met with tremendous skepticism by almost everybody, uh, and me too, because see, uh, if they really have that kind of power, which they do, you know, they own most legislators through um, lobbying and all of this. So um, if they really were serious about uh, committing that 130 uh, uh, trillion, um, uh, what they uh, should have been supporting, which was discussed at COP26, and that is, hey, why don't we have the central banks of the rich countries simply make the next quantitative easing instead of buying up dud mortgages, um, putting them on their balance sheet? Uh, why not have green QE and buy green bonds, you know, and all of this? And similarly with the IMF. Uh, what Kristalina Georgieva did, uh, very much criticized, like the economists wanted to get her fired. But what she did was instead of doing loans to countries so that they could get vaccines, she gave them grants. And so you could do exactly the same thing at the IMF. You could have another issue of special drawing rights, green SDRs, and let's put that 100 uh, billion a year into the developing countries as we promised to do, and also add the 1.3 trillion a year so that developing countries can leapfrog uh, from the fossil fuels to the now cheaper, cleaner solar, wind, and energy efficiency. So uh, we all know now, um, that all the NGO communities, that governments create money through their central banks and uh, in, the, in our constitution in the USA, it's the Congress um, that creates the money. So um, of course, our educational priorities, I have very much enjoyed uh, listening in on all these conversations. So, you know, civics now um, and, and literacy now means uh, agreement on a very basic new meta story. 
And most of our children, like the 4 million young people who refused to go to school and join Greta Thunberg uh, in talking about, let's forget the fairy tales about GDP growth. Um, basically, the meta story, which most NGOs at uh, COP26 and most of our children and the climate change activists agree on, um, is basically we are all one species, we humans. We know that from our DNA. 2% of our DNA um, is from Neanderthals. So, you know, it goes back that far. And we know too that we are completely interdependent and dependent on all of the other species in the biosphere and maintaining the um, diversity of the biosphere. And we know also that we live on an abundant planet. We get all of these free photons every day, which um, the plants are, uh, in our biosphere have learned with the first technology in the world, which is photosynthesis, how to turn those, photo, uh, those photons into carbohydrates and our food supply and everything that we need to survive. All we need to do is to regain um, the mutual aid and community sectors and um, value them uh, more highly. And we need media literacy now. I'll talk more about that later because it involves um, the social media in the US that have no rules at all and no liability and are transmitting misinformation about viruses um, at the speed of light. And of course, uh, normal uh, academic and media companies can't possibly keep up. So I want to look at the whole thing about teaching technological literacy. And um, I learned about that through my role as a cabinet level science advisor to the US Office of Technology Assessment, OTA. And I uh, joined OTA uh, in 1975 um, as one of its advisors. And um, in 1977, we put on the Asilomar Conference, uh, which for the first time said to genetic engineering um, in academia, stop, we need a moratorium. And we had a, a, an actual moratorium, uh, which still exists um, on, on that. And today, uh, even though OTA only lasted from 1975 till 1996, when the Republicans came in and uh, destroyed it because our research was far too truthful uh, to too many special interests uh, and was shut down. Uh, now um, it's back on the agenda of the Biden administration and will probably be revived uh, because today's technological issues are about regulating um, art artificial intelligence really is no such thing. It, it's human trained machine learning. Uh, is nothing artificial about it. And uh, monitoring algorithms and making them uh, open and um, searchable uh, and also shifting social media to the public interest. Uh, and of course the shift to circular economies. These all require uh, taking all the marvelous Cartesian reductionist research that we, we now have and integrating it uh, into public policy. So um, I just um, wrote an article which went live today, uh, basically uh, talking about the need to slow down, to slow down the speed of infotech. And see Silicon Valley now uh, digitizing everything for profit, let's face it, it's all for profit, um, is basically, um, operating at the speed of light. And we have to remember from our physics lessons that um, human beings are bound uh, on this planet by the laws of thermodynamics. And our hearts only beat so fast, our legs only take us so far, 
And it still takes 365 days for our planet to circulate our mother star, the sun. And so um, instead of what's happening now, which we're all being urged to catch up, catch up, speed up uh, somehow um, to uh, achieve these speeds um, that are going by the speed of light, um, we have to stop and uh, take another look at it. And I was just quoting from the new book called The, um, the Age of, AT of AI by, of all people, Henry Kissinger and this former CEO of Google, uh, Eric Schmidt. And uh, they are making the same point. And uh, they're saying that the human mind um, simply isn't, doesn't function at internet speeds. And so uh, we have to slow down the internet speeds. We can't change, uh, we can't, the human minds are never going to be able to operate at the speed of light. And so I first caught on to this mismatch between these physical realms um, in a paper I did for the UN called Perspectives on Reforming Electronic Markets and Trading. And of course, we realized with these high frequency traders, just to make money out of money, um, they are speeding up trading um, by nanoseconds, you know, and I mean, it's absurd. It's all childish stuff. And we know how to stop it because we did uh, in Al Asilomar in 1977 um, in the case of genetic engineering. So we're not helpless. We can steer our intellect. Um, and this is an article I did in Cadmus for the World Academy, uh, toward public interest and maturity and these common uh, understandings and common goals. And I, I just wanna end by saying that we are making progress. Uh, the golden rule um, was the first way, the first time centuries ago, where humans actually pretty much agreed um, on a mutual responsibility uh, with the whole uh, do as you would be done by, a perfect system statement. And then fast forward to the year 1215 in England with Magna Carta, another huge advance with the writ of habeas corpus, when we said, the king doesn't own your body, you own your own body. And we've updated that at Ethical Markets, you also own your own mind and the information that you generate, um, which we're not going to allow these uh, social media companies to sell all of our information um, and make money out of it. Then um, we can fast forward to 1948 with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's work and the UN De Declaration of Human Rights. And then to the year 2000, where I was thrilled to participate in the launching of the Earth Charter, which was almost accepted by the UN that the 16 principles of human responsibility, and I still promote um, the Earth Charter as far, as far as I can. And you go to earthcharter.org for that. So it, it's, um, this is what education has to be about now. This true human situation on planet Earth. Planet Earth is now teaching us direct, directly, whether it's pandemics or climate uh, catastrophes. So we're going beyond narcissism and anthropocentrism. And uh, so thank you so much, appreciate it.